the graveyard, our final resting place as a human being. But is it final? Now this is a question that has intrigued many for hundreds of years. Going back to the dawns of time, we've all wondered, is there something beyond bodily death? In this programme, we're going to look at new claims that the dead are actually talking to us. Paranormal investigators worldwide are bringing what they believe is evidence to the table of the voices of the dead on cassette and digital recorders. Is there more? Beyond this, do we live again? Let's go and find out. In this programme, we're going to look at new claims that the dead are actually talking to us. Paranormal investigators worldwide are bringing what they believe is evidence to the table of the voices of the dead on cassette and digital recorders. I would say there's a good possibility, maybe 75% possibility, they could well be the voices of the dead. You may have seen the film White Noise. What did you think? Are these really the voices of the dead? The investigators tell us they are. The skeptics tell us no, it's taxi bleed over or freak radio waves. You make your own mind up. One of the people who seems to be distressed is someone I knew very, very well that I worked with on the Sunday Times. I worked there as a journalist for, for quite a long time and um, he was on that paper too as the picture editor. He was a great, great friend of mine and he said, go and tell him, go and get him. Someone, go and find him, bring him, fetch him. There's someone here who wants to talk to him. He needs help. He needs someone to know. He needs someone who can help him. Go and get him. Go and get Hallam. Hallam, the dead man. Hmm. Puzzling. Let's have a look at it on here. Sounds quite conclusive, doesn't it? But is it our brain pattern matching? Because that's what we want to hear. If I'd have played this EVP to you and not told you what it said, would you have identified it? This is a question we're going to address in part of the programme. The recording that allegedly says, Hallam the Dead Man. On first hearing this recording, it didn't sound like that to me, although it did sound a little like a human voice. It was only after reviewing this recording many times that I could begin to pick out that phrase from the noise. What is real? What isn't real? Am I real? I was particularly interested in psychic photography and I always wondered why nobody had done anything with tape. If you can get things on film, why can't you get things on tape? And I was quite surprised when a book came out called Breakthrough by Constantine Raldiva in about 1971 which described exactly what I was thinking. People had been getting voices on tape, extra voices that shouldn't really be there. And I set to work experimenting in my home with an, an old uh, reel-to-reel tape recorder um, and I started to get results quite early on actually um, and one of the side effects I noticed was that I used to be doing the experiments and I'd get the feeling that I was being watched in the room and this is something that had never happened to me before and it was quite unnerving to a certain extent but I carried on for a while. I stopped the experimenting. Um, it was a period of time when I'd just bought a house in my life and I moved into that house etc. And then we started, when I, after I'd got married, um, we started um, seances in our house and because we wanted to record the, uh, the proceedings and we found these extra voices were turning up on the tapes 
and that's basically how it started. In, initially, I, I didn't need to invest a lot of money in it because I, my background was in electronics. I worked for BT and uh, the book, Breakthrough, had a lot of circuits in and I built some of those up. And I, I, There's one called um, a diode in the book which is actually a very simple receiving set and I did something which was similar but I amplified it first of all and you've got a lot of white noise in the background but it was quite difficult to listen to that to be honest. The film White Noise, mm -hmm. now I've been to the pictures and seen it, I know you have as well, yes. uh, do you think it correctly relays the message that we need to get across about how EVP works or do you think they've done the Hollywood job on it? I think they've done the Hollywood job on it to be honest, particularly they've concentrated on the negative side, the negative side to give it um, a good storyline, yes, and also they concentrated more on the the transcommunication side where you're using the TV and trying to pick up pictures. This is ITC communication. Yeah, so it's yeah. not a side that I've experimented with myself a lot because it's so time consuming. Also they didn't portray, when you do ITC you're supposed to film about a minute and then you're supposed to look at each frame individually which is so time consuming when you've got 25 frames a second I think it is. They've actually put EVPs down as one in twelve being evil or of a dark nature. Mm. Have you found that in your research? I've never found that. No, I've, I've very. I, I can only think of one instance when I was using a, a modified radio receiver, and I picked up. It sounded like children in distress, sort of shouting out. But I've never had anything of that aspect. More of a cry for help than evil. Yes, or dark so I think so. The the only thing that did disturb me, as we were talking about earlier, was the feeling of being watched, because it was a really strong feeling and I've never really experienced anything like that in my life before. Gary Johnson is the North West Area team leader for Phantom or Fraud and has become somewhat of an expert in capturing EVPs. EVPs have always been interesting to me because uh, they add another perspective to the evidence that's being gathered um, on a scientific basis, hopefully, that can be analysed in the laboratory or even uh, by uh, people who are uh, unaccustomed to scientific investigations uh, and can therefore uh, experiment on their own and uh, analyse their uh, results at home. There's a lot of theories that are badgered around about what these voices are. Uh, certainly in, it is my belief that somebody is trying to communicate. Uh, some things can be explained, others can't. Uh, the science of uh, EVPs is still in its infancy, I believe. We've had some very interesting results, uh, both with teams and on an indiv individual basis. Um, cemeteries uh, are one uh, place that seem to be uh, something that uh, I like to go and investigate from time to time. Um, I've had a, an interesting result there, uh, whereby um, I was asking a group of uh, investigators that were with me um, if they had any questions that they would like to ask uh, perhaps to somebody who could answer via the EVP. Uh, what we did find is that a young boy came back very, very clearly saying, I, I have asked a simple question. So he'd already asked a question. On returning to the tape and rewinding the tape further back, very faintly in the background, he asked, did any of the people there recognize him or know him? Walking around with a team of people, uh, what I, I, I actually did was um, I uh, opened myself up to the contact that may be made from the spiritual realms. And uh, whilst doing that, um, I heard a voice being called to me and sensed an individual some 20 feet away uh, indicating to me um, uh, a particular memorial or grave. Um, he gave a name um, of William at the time. And um, after I said this, um, I mentioned it to, the, to the, uh, the rest of the group that were with me and asked them to go and look at the grave uh, marker to see if the name William was on it. At the same time, the EVP recorded, as the people were approaching the gravestone, uh, the name Bill being given in a, quite a gruff voice. And the gravestone said William when they went to actually check this out. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. We were uh, we were in William Hill, and um, uh, we'd heard that next door in Victoria Wines, um, 
they also had to experience uh, some strange phenomena. So we went across uh, next door to the, uh, to the the Victoria Wine Shop and were guided to the upper rooms where we uh, conducted a, a couple of experiments, one of them being EVP. The One of the rooms in particular that drew us, uh, our attention was the fact that um, it had been subject to uh, movements of objects and noises at uh, all times of the day and night. Uh, Whenst up there, um, I uh, placed a, a recorder in the room and um, as we were talking with the staff uh, about what the room was used for, predominantly a storage area for cigarettes, in came a voice that said SIGS quite clearly on the EVP. It's a recordable um, piece of evidence. It's something that we can investigate uh, a lot further, a lot more in depth. We can ask questions if we relate it to the spirit world. Then we can ask questions, hopefully get correct answers by uh, a communication, just as we would using perhaps a telephone. Uh, to ask other people um, uh, questions and answers via that type of link. But we have the, the added uh, bonus of being able to replay and play and, and then present these uh, recordings to other people uh, so that they too can perhaps um, try this particular um, method and phenomena for themselves. You're going to hear some very, very strange recordings. You make your own mind up. Are these the dead talking to us, or is there a far more rational and logical explanation? Come with me. This EVP was recorded in Yorkshire by the UK GI. Have a listen and see what you think it says. <coughs> okay. They think it says, busy bugger. Hmm, interesting. They were probably busy buggers when they were filming it. But, I've edited this down, had a listen to it again, taking out some of the noise, and it seems to say something completely different. <coughs> Gish your money. Now, could this have been someone, perhaps a highwayman? Gish your money. What do you think? <coughs> One of Gary's EVPs seems to indicate somebody saying SIGS during a conversation in an off-license investigation where they're actually talking about cigarettes. See what you think. It does seem to say SIGS. Let's have a look at the edited version. We've blown this one up, taken out some of the background noise. Listen again. It does appear to say SIGS. Now the strange thing about these EVPs is we do seem to be getting words, actual words. Therefore it would indicate a human voice rather than perhaps a background sound. And many of the sceptics are telling us it's background sounds, it's bleed over. I don't know, I'm not so convinced. This is a strange one. See if you can think what this says. What do you think it says? Let's have a look at the edited version. It seems to say, I asked a simple question. Now again, can this really be a background sound or a bleed over? It's very, very clear to me. In the making of this program, the EVPs that have been presented, which I've listened to, have gone no further to convince me that these are actually the voices of the dead. To my mind, they're certainly of the type where it's human interpretation of random noises, background hiss, the characteristics of the recording device that are being misinterpreted as human voices. Freak radio waves can have many sources, not just the local taxi cabs passing by or even a local radio station. Even a TV switched on in an adjacent room can transmit inadvertently on radio frequencies, which can then be picked up by other equipment. Canadian EVP expert Alan Hatfield claims he has two-way conversations with the dead. 
he wanders into graveyards with recording devices and seems to get strange voices on tape. If he can do it, so can we, can't we? Nick Sharrett and I wandered into the graveyard at the St Mary's Church in Exbourne in Devon and we tried the experiment for ourselves. Nick, digital EVP recorder used by many of these EVP investigators and I believe you have one as well? I do indeed, yes. Okay, cemetery seems a funny place. I don't know about you, but if I died and I was rested at a place like this, I wouldn't want to stay here, would you? No, I'd like to see the world again. Definitely. Yes, I think so too. I think the pub's going to be a far better bet because that's where I'd go. That sounds a good idea to me. <laughs> but let's try it. If the dead really can talk to us, these machines should be able to record it. So let's both set our machines up to record. We'll ask some questions and then we'll go back and check to see whether or not anything appears on here that shouldn't be here. And then perhaps, as a sceptic, you can tell me what they are. I'll certainly try. Are you a sceptic, really? Oh, very much so. You don't believe in the paranormal at all? I'm open to be proven wrong. Let's hope we can prove you wrong right now. OK. I'm in record. OK. And recording as well. If there's anybody here that would like to talk to us, perhaps you could record your voice on this machine with your name, or anything you can tell us about you. This is the Red Lion in the heart of Exbourne in Devon. And this is the place we've chosen to carry out our EVP experiments to see if we can capture voices of the dead. Let's go inside. My name's uh, Dave Wilson, I've been the landlord of the Red Line now for just coming up for four years and uh, ever since we've been here there's been some uh, unexplained things, things moving about and things that uh, we can't find and all of a sudden they turn up where we know we've looked several times and uh, my, my daughter, she lost her cigarettes one time and she searched her pockets and what have you and then uh, all of a sudden they turn up in her pockets and lost her car keys the same way and then they turn up. Well, they put this down to a, a ghost called Patrick. He was a, an old landlord. Well, he's, he's Arthur Patrick, his name is. His surname's Patrick. Well, everyone knows him as Patrick. And um, we sort of got talking to him, and uh, my wife did. Uh, and one of the things he did like is, is, the, um, is the fire. He um, loved his fire. He won't, anyone touched his fire when he was here, he, he, he'd go mad. He, he was the one who looked after it. And when we had trouble get, trying to get the fire going, and my wife goes, come on, Patrick, let's get the fire going. And, and all of a sudden, it's just roaring to life. And it turns uh, quite, quite funny, really. An investigation actually done by a group of people, because they, they sort of heard about Patrick, and uh, they did a, an investigation, but they never found anything on Patrick. But they did find out about an, another one, a, a woman called Catherine, who was um, supposed to be a high-class hooker. Now, my granddaughter was staying here at one time, and there's... Um, a story she said, and she would have been about three, and she woke up, and um, this is in the morning, and she said, Mummy, when I awoke, uh, there was a lady by my bed, and she pinched my bottom, and uh, it was strange, I didn't think much of it, and until this, uh, this meeting people, they, they came up with a story uh, about Catherine, and they said that uh, she, she seems to like the men uh, doing their sports, i.e. when they're playing pool or darts or maybe, and um, she would watch. And people have seen sort of shadows. Yeah, we have had a, an investigation before. Um, the same thing you're doing tonight. Um, there's a few people sort of heard about these stories and what have you. And uh, they stayed here after time. And it must have been about uh, three in the morning. They went around with um, heat detectors and what have you, and they found cold spots here and cold spots there. And um, they had the infrared camera so we could you know, see things at night, which I've never seen before. It was amazing what you can see. And um, they sat down and had a, like a bit of a seance. And there's four of them sat around the table. And this would have been four, about three, half past three in the morning. So it's all sort of quiet, maybe. And they said, is there anyone out there who would like to talk to us? And, uh, and as I said that, the, the phone rang, just a, but a continuous ring. And this is funny. You know, and everyone, oh, God, I don't believe it. And to pick the phone up, nobody there. And then after that, it stopped, and it's never done that before, and it's never done it since. And it just these sceptic people were looking around; they couldn't find nothing wrong, no reason for it at all. Yeah. But the rear bar shutter fell down. Now this leans over backwards, and it fell down with a bang. I thought, what? It was like a gun going off, it wasn't. 
Hayne went round investigating, and, and again, it's never done it before, it's never done it since. And why it did it, I don't know. It's almost like a, it was something that was angry. You know. the Red Lion. We're now going to try our own attempt at EVP recording. Nick's got his machine at the ready. I've got mine at the ready. When you're ready Nick, we'll both press record. Just started now. Okay. We'll put them both down next to each other and see if there's any voices that want to record on there. So if there's anybody in the pub of a non-human nature, if you'd like to speak into these machines and tell us who you are and why you're here. For the benefit of the tape, this is EVP test 3. We're going to roll both machines, but this time with background noise to see if we can create a white noise effect. So we're going to run the taps. So we can turn the taps on, Dave. Okay, if there are any disembodied spirits here in the pub at all, could you now please speak to either of the two machines? Maybe just my imagination, but listening to the water sounds as if it's a voice to me. Anyway, okay. almost in answer to the questions you were asking. Okay. okay. Well, we stopped there. Mm -hmm. Is that light was on? We're now with your question. I thought it's some change. Oh, that this this goes on part way through. Oh, that one. <coughs> yeah, but, uh, I thought that light was but, on. Uh, yeah, but that has done, Jeremy. That's still looking on his own. It has done. He has, done. has a touch, touch yeah. of light. Our own EVP recordings, both in the graveyard and the Red Lion, proved a little fruitless on this occasion. Although there was what appears to be a whispering sound in the background behind when we had the tap running. But Nick Sharrett believes he has an explanation for this. As part of the experiments we conducted for this program, we recorded a EVP session where running water was playing in the background. I actually noticed while we were recording that that following one of Ross's questions there was a noise in the sound of the water that even at the time sounded to me a little like a voice answering him. In that case it was clear that it wasn't an electronic phenomenon but the actual water sound coincidentally mimicking the characteristics of a human voice. I couldn't actually discern a particular phrase or word in that sound, but just the similarity to a human voice. Are you aware of the others who are present? Following that investigation, we analysed that recording to look at that particular se segment in particular. And unsurprisingly, we could actually discern what sounded a, a little like a human whisper. However, even with various filtering and amplification, we couldn't actually make out any particular words or phrases. Professor Maurice Gross is probably best known for his work with the Enfield Poltergeist. But there's a part of that case that relates to EVP, not so much in that the voices were caught on tape, but the fact that he believes the voices of the dead came through the children in the house. The voice identified itself, identif sorry, identified itself very clearly in that um, it was asked a question, how did you die? And this is before we knew anything about the character he was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, I, I went blind uh, and I had a hemorrhage and I died in the chair in the corner downstairs. Well, we didn't know the manner of his death. We, we then identified the fact that uh, the man had lived in the house 15 years before, but we didn't know anything about him at all. And it was only later on, much later on, that we got proper identification because I'd just done a radio program and um, 
I had a telephone call after that radio programme. And the man at the other end said, oh, that was a very interesting programme I just heard. I said, why? He said, well, it was particularly interesting. I said, because of what you heard? He said, yes, of course of what I heard. He said, that poltergeist was my father. Oh. And uh, he'd lived in the house with his father, and, and he confirmed what, what the voice had told us. But uh, there were other things. I mean, we, we, uh, we did tests with a laryngograph machine to show us that the voice was not made by the larynx, but by the false vocal fold, which is above the larynx. And if you use that too much, you can do your great damage to your throat to the larynx. And uh, we knew then that the, the, the child couldn't possibly be imitating this voice. It wasn't possible. I mean, we had speech therapists who came and said it was not possible. But uh, there's no question about it that, the, that the Janet would have been unable to keep up that sort of voice for any, le for any length of time. And yet the voice sometimes spoke, not continuously, up to three hours. Um, the voice then came from the other three other children, the other three children, the same a voice. Right. So who was imitating what? <laughs> but the the most important thing about the voice, as far as we're concerned, is we had no idea. I mean, Guy Playfair, myself, nobody else had any clue what a poltergeist voice was supposed to sound like. And Guy did a bit of research. And he found an old case in the 18th century in an old English inn. And it was describing a, a poltergeist talking. And it said it spoke in a deep, gruff, staccato, old man's voice. Exactly the same voice as we had in Enfield. Mm. Now, how did Janet know to talk like that? Yeah, she was, that's right. Anyway, if Janet was doing it, we had the world's greatest conjurer and the world's greatest ventriloquist sitting in that house at 11 years old. Jeremy Holland is a scientist and natural philosopher. He attended our investigation last night at the Red Lion pub in Exbourne and he honestly believes he saw a ghost. During the course of the evening, during the EVP tests, I noticed what appeared to be a, a figure standing in front of the fireplace. And I got quite a clear impression of this figure and it persisted for ooh, a good couple of minutes while people were moving around it. The figure was that of a fairly short lady, um, I would imagine probably in middle age, um, dressed in a long black cloak or coat, with several petticoats, a bustle, and a hat with ribbons on it. The style of dress was somewhere I would imagine around about mid to late Victorian period, possibly early, early Edwardian. I have made a sketch. This is the impression that I received of the person. As you can see, she was, had her back more or less to me and appeared to be looking out towards the entrance. I have very strong beliefs. Um, I am almost certain that I have lived before. I am therefore a, a very strong believer in reincarnation. I also believe that various activities mm, which are observed, or phenomena which are observed by various people have some sort of basis. But I'm also a scientist, and I believe that many reported phenomena can actually be dismissed as artifacts or natural occurrences. On EVP generally, I'm very sceptical. Um, I don't really see the point of a disembodied spirit trying to communicate via a piece of electronic equipment, which it may not even understand. But I would point out that if breakthroughs are coming through from electronic transmissions and being picked up by the equipment, uh, they, could, they don't necessarily have to be in English. They could be in any language which may be interpreted by English speakers as sounding like some English phrase. Or, alternatively, if you happen to be in Germany, you might interpret the phrase as saying something else in German. I myself have done quite a lot of tests by, by detaching microphones, by uh, uh, 
uh, setting up a very, very simple recept uh, receptive circuit and you still get these strange things happening and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be. With, with the advent of digital radio you might get this type of information, this type of interference. But uh, under normal circumstances, if you're using a tape recorder and you take and you don't use the microphone, there's very little chance of it picking up radio interference. It, ca it can happen under certain circumstances, but there's very little chance of it happening. And I don't think that that particular interpretation from the skeptics is valid. Uh, I believe it's based more on ignorance than on knowledge. The skeptic can always give an answer. There's very little thing. If, if you present them with, with facts, as I try to do, with physical facts, as I try to do, the answer is usually silence. <laughs> but if, if you press them for an answer, they say, well, there must, be an, there must be an explanation to this, you see. And it's a cop out. There must be an explanation. Well, we know there may be, whatever the explanation is, whether it's up there or down there. There must be an explanation, I suppose, but that's a cop out. But uh, a lot of uh, a lot of skeptics, and I, I don't include everybody in this, of course, because there are some skeptics who are very knowledgeable on the subject. But, but the majority of skeptics know very little about the subject, and all they have heard is hearsay. They either come on an ordinary message that somebody has um, phoned and left a message. And you know, people often pause for a few, for a, even if it's a second, to, before they even say who they are and what they want, and then they, they leave their message. Sometimes there's a pause at the end as they're putting the phone down. Well, spirit voices frequently get in right at the beginning or right at the end, or sometimes they actually overlay on top of a message that uh, people have left and say things that are pertinent. Quite amusing sometimes, you know, I've had... Um, spirits giving me advice, like, uh, don't trust him. And very, very well said, actually, on that particular occasion, because that person was not to, not be, to trusted. be trusted. Mm. And, uh, and, and then they've said on other occasions, phone back, you phone back. You know, like, <laughs> this is important to you. You know, they're, they're really kind of there, in, in there yeah. with me, so much of the time. Um, and then it's, it's, it's got a, um, a memo button here. Uh, which records, um, oh, it's supposed to be a little note for yourself or whatever. Mm -hmm. so, but if I press that, and I did it um, again inadvertently, I wasn't intending to actually to record at all. I just pressed it and it did record. And um, my son often comes through on that. Right. Very often. He comes through, mu through much more on this than on the, this recorder. But that's partly because, um, you know, someone else is hogging this most of the time. Sure. I don't think he can get yeah. through. Hi. I'm going to Reading University, and I'm going to see Linda Shockey. This was recorded in um, a circle. A friend at work. It was. It was during the time when um, there was a device that came came out called a Spiricom some years ago. You may have heard of that. And uh, a friend at work built me a, a Spiricom, and it actually. Ha produce these these strange tones you couldn't actually physically hear them but it was it was on in the background and we had a voice that cut in and it said not essential um, this is this is the um, the whole clip the voice is in that area there Mike Rogers gave us this EVP which he thinks says not essential and he relates it to somebody in a stone circle saying that certain equipment that he was using was not essential. Let's see if he's right. Hmm, strange. Let's have a look at the version we've edited and played around with. Let's see what you think now. Now there seems to be a J which rules out the not. And I think it's saying John to central, or John it's central. Could this actually be a case of taxi bleed over? No, it's not with a chip. Oh, sorry, sorry. Chip. Oh, sorry, sorry. Chip. Oh, sorry, sorry. I found that uh, quite interesting, um, particularly when the signal was 
was cleaned up a little bit, as the voice actually quite clearly said something to Central, probably John or Joan to Central. And that sounded to me very much like um, a bit of a breakthrough from perhaps a taxi firm. If for a moment we put these recordings into a biblical context, there's nothing in the evidence presented to separate the voices of the dead and the dear departed loved ones from possible mischievous spirits or familiar spirits as they're often referred to in the Bible. They could quite easily impersonate the departed and pass on anecdotes. In my view there is a similarity in the processes of interpreting these noises as voices with the investigation into the Bible code. In both of those cases you are looking at a complex and possibly even chaotic uh, set of data in many different ways until patterns are found. Simply finding those patterns is not evidence that there is any significance to them, just that the investigator has looked very hard. Now this is an interesting one. It seems to say we're alive now. Probably not what you'd expect a dead person to say. But then again, it could be our next stage of life. See what you think. Now the interesting thing with this one is if you reverse it and play it backwards, it seems even more audible. Hello. Now we put Nick Sharrett to the test on this one and we got him to record the same words as were spoken on the EVP and then we reversed it. And this is how the reverse of his came back. Nothing like hello. If it is indeed brain pattern matching, then there should be a good percentage of people who will hear different things. If it's an actual EVP and clear, we should all be hearing the same thing. So I'm going to put you to the test. I'm going to play you an EVP now, and I'm not going to tell you what it's supposed to be saying. What I want you to do is study the EVP, listen to it a few times, and then email me via the website at www.phantomorefraud.com. I'm going to compile the answers and see how many of you got it right. I'll study the results and publish them on the website in the not-too-distant future. Let's see what you think of this. <laughs> When loaded on the computer, the EVP reads out what's called a waveform. And by looking at the waveform, we can see that there are peaks and troughs within the reading. So where the EVP is supposed to be, there appears to be what looks like a voice pattern. Now that's promising, because perhaps if it was bleed over, interference or background noise, these wave patterns would look very different. One of Heidi Graham's EVPs, and she says that the doorbell had just gone at the time this EVP was captured, where a voice seems to say, Pretty Bell. The interesting part of that recording seems to be near the end there, Ross, so shall we select that bit and edit it further? Select a bit of the background noise and do the usual filtering to remove that. Let's see what it sounds like then. Ah, now, that sounds, what is the bell, rather than Pretty Bell. What is the bell? Remember, Ross, that we said earlier that filtering these things seems to be introducing arbitrary uh, interpretations of the sound. Is that what we're guilty of? Actually, Ross, I'm listening to that a few more times. It sounds more like to me, the pretty bell, as if we just introduced another syllable to the recording. I still stick with what is the bell, that's what I think it is. The UK Ghost Investigators started about two years ago, um, but I've always been interested in the paranormal since I was about seven. Uh, the house I used to live in uh, was haunted by a Roman soldier that used to climb up and down our stairway. Um, but of course parents, they just try and sort of say, yes dear, it's just an imagination, but I knew otherwise. And ever since then, I've just been hanging around graveyards and looking for things for myself. But then when I got to a certain age and I decided I wanted to start my own club, see if there was others out in the world that wanted to do the same. So we started the club. We started on a small group to start with, but now we've got over 700 non-members. 
I can honestly say we haven't got any evil EVPs. We've never had a nasty person come through. I think the only ones we get are the ones that say either get out or leave us alone. They're obviously, they don't want to be disturbed. They just want to be left alone. But we don't get any nasty ones. We don't get, we don't get threatened by any of them. So they are people that just want us to leave them alone. And when, if that's the case, then we do. The story of the silent is, is that the ghost of a lady who used to feed the local stray cats, she would ring a bell at 12 midnight to bring the cats in for feeding. And at 12 midnight, we were doing table tipping and we were getting a good result with that. And then everybody at 12 midnight just turned their head because they all heard the sound of a bell coming from the front door. And then as we were playing the EVPs while we were doing the table tipping, as we played back, there was the bell ringing. Then you heard somebody say, pretty bell. Yet we were all too gobsmacked to say anything at the time because we just heard the bell. I think they're coming from the next plane, the plane that we go to immediately we die. Um, whether you call it the astral plane or whatever you want to call it, I don't know. And I don't know how many other planes there are um, as well as this next one, but I think they are coming to the, very, the one that is the closest to, to us. Some come back to do jobs, i.e. guardian angels, spirit guides. Some come back like murder victims, they might come back for help to try and put their murderer to justice or some just come forward because they don't want to leave. I'm a spiritualist medium. The voices that I've recorded over the past couple of years uh, with, the, with the help of the EVP methods that I've been using, I believe, are the spirit world and the dead contacting us again. Uh, the, the spiritualists, of course, claim that they're spirit voices. They may well be, but you see, di talking dimensionally, we live in a three-dimension world, we've only got five senses. If there are other, are other dimensions out there, fourth, fifth, and God knows how many more, and there are parallel universes, who knows? Perhaps we are being lived alongside, and perhaps the, the soul is really a substantial after, it, uh, after death, as some claim it to be. As someone who has seen a ghost, well, more than one, and being a firm believer in reincarnation through regression, uh, I still remain very sceptical about EVP. When things happen to people, they tend to dismiss them because they think they're going to be ridiculed. I've come across this many, many, many times before when I've gone in to investigate something, and I said, well, why haven't you spoken about this before? They said, well, it's very nice to meet somebody like you. We can talk to you, but most people would ridicule us and think we're mad. Mm. Well, now, of course, people are not thought, because of the, the media interest and the wide publicity, people are not thought to be mad when they are immediately put into a psychiatric <laughs> hospital, when they say that they hear voices. And hearing voices doesn't always have to be something that uh, is a problem with the brain. It might be something they really are hearing. Oh, okay.